Hey, what's up everybody, Isaac here with another new world video and today we are continuing our How to Tank series and we are doing that by taking you back up to Tempest. So Tempest is back on the schedule for mutations. Last time we were up here we walked you through a sword and shield and hatchet run through but today we are going to do something different again. We are bringing you a great sword and hatchet walkthrough. And my whole purpose of this is not to tell you that there's only one way you can tank. You know, some people are going to say that unless you are running sword and shield and hammer, then you are absolutely throwing. And try to tell you that there's certain perks that you absolutely have to have on this and on that. But reality is there are many different approaches that can work. Sometimes they will vary depending on the team you're playing with, what is going to work best with that team, how experienced that team is, what the dungeon is, and what your goals are for that dungeon. Whether you're just trying to simply get gold, or whether you are trying to do a speed run, you know, your build is going to vary from run to run, from group to group, and whether you just want to switch things up and have a little bit of fun. So this is going to be an option of switching things up and having a little bit of fun, but also still being very effective. So some people are going to tell you that no great sword, it's not a viable tanking weapon. That it's something you might just use like in lower dungeons. But this is M10 dungeon, a uh, very smashed run, very easily cleared. All tanking it with great sword and hatchet. So. We are going to go over our gear here real quick. We do have the five piece expedition captain's gear and it's got the corrupted ward, which is the absolute must. You absolutely have to have it if you're going to be tanking mutations. And then everything else from there is a bonus. Refreshing is very good. And physical version, it's okay, it's not crazy good, but it's going to help us take a little bit less damage from those archers and muskets. And we got five pieces of that, and it is a void mutation, so we have all of the amethyst gems to reduce damage from void. Five pieces in our armor, and then three gems in our jewelry. So, we don't have a shield to help us mitigate, mitigate extra corrupt ward damage or to mitigate extra void damage like say the shield it has an extra 10 percent void damage mitigation but we can't use it because we don't use our sword and shield in this dungeon for this particular run so we also do not have a void protection amulet which is something i like to have just to make yourself more tanky but we don't have it for this run so this is what we got fortified recovery it's good not like the absolute best possible thing you could have but we also have health and divine so you're gonna have more health and then divine you're gonna gain extra health from all of your incoming any any kind of incoming healing you get you're going to receive that much more healing so very beneficial you know not an absolute bis this is the one you absolutely have to have not by any means but it will do the trick and then our ring we just have leeching and refreshing some will tell you that if you don't have stamina you're dead you know but we have refreshing and leeching on this one and we do just fine running with the great sword which some tell you you don't want to tank with a great sword but we make it work just fine so we got our earring here this is a good one there's definitely a few different options you can have but you should have refreshing toast that's kind of a must have the other two you definitely can get away with some different options just try to pick something that is going to help you out regenerating that's kind of a nice passive heal definitely is helpful don't have it on all of my tanking earrings but running it for this dungeon so and then refreshing evasion every time we dodge is going to help reduce our cooldowns it's not a crazy good perk for us to have but it's helpful so you know you can see we don't have completely everything bissed out best perk this best perk that but it's going to do the trick just fine for us so on to our weapons and our goal here is we want to do some actual good damage 
We're trying to have fun, we're playing Great Sword, and we're trying to output as much damage as we can. So we're playing a damage build as a tank. And on our Great Sword, we have Corrupted Bane, which is kind of a must for this particular situation. Typically as a tank, you don't have to have Corrupted Bane because it's not your job to do the damage. It is obviously helpful to do lots of damage because doing more damage is going to help you hold better threat. And it's going to help your team you know, mow through things a little bit faster, but then Vicious, of course, that's a real good one, too. Every time we do a critical hit, we're going to do an extra 12% damage. So between Corrupted Bane and the Vicious, it's going to help us do a lot of extra damage. So Sturdy, typically a perk that you would consider a slot-locking perk on most weapons, but just for this situation, in this particular case, it happens to be a very nice perk on this great sword because we are being the tank and the great sword it doesn't have a tons of stamina blocking ability but if we can add a little bit of extra stamina to our blocks well I'm just gonna make it just a little bit better so that is our great sword and here's our hatchet and absolutely love refreshing torrent it's what I run on all my hatchets yes you can definitely get away without it I tanked my first many, 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 many M10s with Hatchet without refreshing Torrent. But my favorite perk for sure by far to have on a Hatchet. So definitely something I would look to get. And once again, we are trying to do damage, so we do want the Bane. Yes, of course, as a tank, you can get away without the Bane. But for this particular video, we are trying to be as damage outputty as possible. So we like Bane. And... I do love Chain Eyes. You definitely could just get away with just Corrupted Bane, Refreshing Torrent as a purple hatchet. But if you can get Chain, I love Chain because one, it's going to help us do extra damage to all the mobs around us, which is going to help us do, you know, hold a little bit more aggro on all the mobs. And it's going to also help do more damage to help kill things a little bit faster. So that's our weapons. That's our gear. Let's jump into the build. And for this build, we are going with a 300 strength and 200 con. So it's not an absolute must. You know, some people will tell you you have to be 300 strength and 200 con as a tank. Otherwise, you're throwing. But, you know, I've showed you many different builds that will work just fine throughout my videos. But this is what we're running because we do want to have the grit on all of our basic attacks at 300 strength keep us from getting knocked around but also so we can do some pretty decent damage then we're going to 200 con to make us have a little bit extra survivability if you watch my genesis run i did it with only 100 con but tempest it's a little bit more complicated got a lot bigger pulls and you got to tank a lot more mobs and especially since we're doing that with the great sword well, we want to be at least 200 con to get the extra 10% increase to physical and elemental armor. It's going to make a huge difference. So let's take a look at our weapon builds. So we got our hatchet build. This is my typical tanking hatchet build as long as I have refreshing torrent. And if I have refreshing torrent, using raging torrent is going to help me get my cooldown back off of berserk really fast. And my cooldown off of rending throw really fast. And it's also going to help bring the cooldown of Raging Torrent really fast. Basically, if we got tons of mobs, we can almost infinitely use Raging Torrent. If we are hitting a bunch of mobs at once, we have the Refreshing Torrent. Brings it right back off cooldown. Helps us have near-infinite taunts, near-infinite Raging Torrents, and near-infinite Rending Throws. So, not going to go super in-depth, but of course you got to have Berserk. That's our big taunt. And it's our self-healing, and we got the Defy Death. Comes in super handy as a tank, and as anybody else that's using the hatchet. So we're using the Rending and Throw ability, which is going to allow us to throw some Rend, and help our team kill the big heavy mobs just a little bit faster. We use an Aimed Throw, that way we can at a distance throw our hatchets at mobs in the distance, and grab their aggro. And... Not going to go super in-depth over these as well, but just take a screenshot and check them out on yours. But throwing hatches that hit targets with an active debuff reduce all hatchet ability. Cooldowns by 5%. So this is one that's 
going to come into play, but not like crazy. Because sometimes we'll throw a rending throw, and then we'll throw this, and the refreshing throw will come into play. But it's not like super big. And this one here, critical hits with light attacks and aim throws regenerate 10 stamina. This one is pretty darn good because we are going to be doing a lot of light attacks. And every time we do, we gain 10 stamina. So there's going to be times when we hatch it away. We're just hatching and dodging. So it makes us very survivable that way. It gives us lots of stamina back because we're going to be hitting those crits every now and again. And then right here, all attacks deal 10% additional damage to targets with an active debuff. So we're always trying to debuff targets whenever we can, whether it's our rending throw, you know, whether it's our teammates with something else, whether it's our sword and shield, we're hitting them with our shield rush and we're giving them weak and whatever it is, they're going to have debuffs pretty often. So this one is going to come into play. And going to help us do some extra damage. So let's jump into the greatsword. And we're doing a little bit of a combo build here. So onslaught. When we are in onslaught stance, we're going to do 15% more damage, but we're also going to take 15% more damage. But we're also going to be able to do quick charge on our heavy attacks twice as fast we can heavy attack. So twice as fast, twice as much damage. But consume 10 stamina. So as a tank, obviously, your attacks consuming stamina. Not the best thing in the world, but we do have some things to make up for that. So, Path of Defiance. Defiant stance, damage taken is reduced by 15%, and outgoing damage is reduced. So, we don't like the outgoing damage to be reduced, but taking reduced damage coming in, we do absolutely love that. So, that comes into play huge on this build. So we're going to make sure in the important times we're jumping into the defiant stance and mitigating as much damage as possible. So let's go over the skills that we're going to be using. We're going to be using crosscut. This is going to be our big main damage dealing skill. And what does it do? Slash three times in a quick sequence. 110% on the first, 130% on the second slash, 160 on the third. And we're going to go all the way down to the bottom. And big thing here is base damage of the final strike is increased by 100% if the target is below 50% health. So we start getting those targets low. We hit them with this cross cut. We get an additional 100% damage. Unless we are in onslaught stance, the threshold is increased to 75% instead. So either way, whether it's 75 or whether it's 100, well, it's going to be a significant amount of damage. We're already hitting for 160% damage, but increased by either 100 or by 75, that's really going to hit some hit some big numbers. So we like that. Faster we can kill stuff, faster we get done with the dungeon. So. Two big things that this build is going to be centered around is going to be two of the passives. And um, this one right here, Aggressive Shift. We'll stick to the Onslaught slot side since we started here. But Aggressive Shift, enter Onslaught stance by hitting with a charged heavy attack. So if we want to go into that aggressive ability of Onslaught stance, where we do 15% more damage but we also take more, we're going to do a charged heavy attack. So pretty basic. We want to do heavy damage. We attack with a heavy attack. And we do have an ability that can offset that. So say we go into this heavy attack and we get ourselves into a situation. The boss looks like he's going to hit us with a big whop and hit. Well, we have this guarded shift block for two seconds, causing you to enter defiant stance. And if we start blocking, well, for one, we're going to block whatever attack he's going to hit us with. Even if it does take our stamina away, at the end of the day, at least we blocked it. But if we block for two seconds, then we're going to enter the defiant stance. So we're going to go straight from taking 15% more damage to mitigating 15% extra damage. So this passive guarded shift and this passive aggressive shift is an important part of this build and the way I am using it. So we'll cover the rest of this onslaught side that we're taking. We're taking charged heavy attacks at 15% armor penetration. Obviously, extra armor penetration is going to lead to extra damage. 
become energized by landing a critical hit and regain 5 stamina and 5% base health per second for 5 seconds. So we talked about losing 10 stamina per hit, but whenever we hit a crit, we're going to regain a bunch of stamina. And it's also going to regenerate some health. So as a tank, regenerating health, regaining stamina, definitely going to come in huge. So at the end of the day, we're going to be regenerating as much stamina almost as we lose from this fast quick charge costing us 10 stamina so we come down here critical hit chances increase by 10 percent so obviously it's going to work hand in hand with this the more time we hit these crits the more this is going to pop and this does have a 10 second cooldown so we can be up on that about 50 percent of the time obviously not exactly you're not going to have perfect uptime but this is going to help it and it also helps us get down to this last passive after dodging gain 10 percent in power for the next three hits within 10 seconds so obviously like i mentioned we are trying to do damage with this build you know part of having fun but also part of just helping our team mow through the dungeon and then attacks empowered by this effect restore 10 stamina on hit so there you go losing 10 up here but we're gaining 10 per hit back down here for three hits. So between here and here, we're pretty much making up for any of the lost stamina that we get from being in the onslaught stance. So these passes kind of make up for that, plus they help us do a lot of extra damage. So on to the defiant side of things. So... The first one we're taking here, Calamity Counter. And this one is really important. We're going to play off this one a lot. We're going to want to make sure that this ability is off of cooldown and ready to use anytime we go into a sticky situation. So we go in to do a pull. We taunt everything with our hatchet. And then when they come to mob us, we pull out our Calamity Counter. And we smack them with that and we're not going to lose any stamina. It's also like a safeguard. If we're in a position where we're blocked and we lose all our stamina, we don't have any stamina left to block with, well, we can use our Calamity Counter, and it's basically an attack, except it's using an ability, so it doesn't require stamina to use it. And we're going to take it all the way down. Counter attacks inflict bleeding for 6 seconds for each power level. Each stack deals 5% weapon damage every second, and it can stack up to 5 times. So definitely some significant bleed there. Counter attack crit chance is increased by 25%. So obviously anytime we're doing crits, definitely a very good thing. We talked about some of that stuff over here where that's going to be beneficial. And then in Defiant Stance, the counter attack heals for 20% of its damage. So oftentimes we are going to be in Defiant Stance when we use this because we're going to be blocking first. You know, we'll go in, we'll do a taunt with our hatchet, and then we'll go into a block with our guarded shift to activate Defiant Stance, and then we're going to go into Calamity Counter after we lose a little bit of our stamina. Then we're going to go ahead and use Calamity Counter. At the end of the day, if we don't get into Defiant Stance, it's not the end of the world. We are going to miss out on that healing effect but we will enter defiant stance after this ability is used so regardless if we weren't already in it we will enter it after this ability is used and help mitigate any incoming damage so the other ability we're using on this side is roaring rupture i gotta exit out of this thing so i can get rid of that countdown timer so we can read everything a little bit better here. But yeah, Roaring Rupture. Stab the ground. Send out a shockwave with a 4 meter radius that deals 120% weapon damage gain. 8% 4 to 5 for 5 seconds for each full hit. And it can stack up to 3 times. So right there we can get up to 24% fortify, which is going to happen quite often. Because we are going to be surrounded by mobs many times by more than 3 mobs. Since we're the tank, we're trying to gather them all to us. So that 24 fortify, it's going to happen quite often so we got 24 percent fortify there mixed with 20 with 15 percent damage mitigation so you could see we're already getting pretty tanky by having this great sword and we're gonna come right on down purifying or cleanse to debuffs after using 
Gorin Rupture are obviously very nice to have. There are going to be mutation specific debuffs that we cannot cleanse with this, but there's going to be others that we can, so very nice to have. But then we come down here, Shockwave applies 10% weak, and this is where it gets really good, so we're going to gather a bunch of mobs to us, and then we're going to use this, because it is actually a taunt as well. It generates 200% threat, and it has grit, so it won't be interrupted, but it is your taunt, so as long as you got a Carnelian gem in there, you're going to taunt them with this ability, and when it ends, you're going to enter Defiant Stance, so... We use this ability, we go into Defiant Stance, and we mitigate 15% of incoming damage. So, yeah, we're going to gather everything, we're going to taunt it with our Roaring Rupture, and then we are going to apply Weaken to everything that surrounds us. So, we're going to apply 10% Weaken. We're already going to get this Fortify, and we're already going to have 15% reduced damage. So you can see how this greatsword does get pretty darn tanky. A lot of damage mitigation. So let's go over the extra passives that we're using on this side. We already covered the guarded shift, which lets us enter Defiant Stance by blocking. Really important to understand the difference between being in Defiant Stance and being in Onslaught Stance. Really important to know which stance you're in at all times. So... Blade honing. Base damage is increased by 3% for each great sword buff on you. Max of 4 buffs. So we're constantly going to be using our abilities and getting those buffs up. So definitely a very good one to have. Anytime we can do extra damage. Very important. And charged heavy attacks have grit and inflict bleeding for 6 seconds. Dealing 5% weapon damage every second. So, also another very strong ability, we can start stacking up those bleeds, doing some nice GOT to a bunch of the mobs. So, once again, another good little bonus of some output damage that we can take. And Faultless Defender, reduce stamina damage by 50% when blocking attacks just after raising your guard or with guard point. And then inflicts a 5% rend for 10 seconds against melee attackers so when we can and you can get up to three stacks so 15 stack of rend at maximum so anytime we have stamina reduction anytime we can be throwing rend on the enemies so our teammates and ourselves can mow them down a lot faster gonna be super super handy and we do end up taking what i call the ultimate on the right side the defiance tree and heal for five percent of the damage from attacks so obviously as a tank, when we can have a little bit of extra healing coming in, it's going to help us with our survivability. So we can be sitting there hacking away and face tanking a little bit extra stuff because we're doing damage, but we're healing for some of that damage we do. But then we read the next line down. Attacking within 3 seconds of blocking heals for 15% of the damage dealt instead. So we're going to be hitting this perk quite often because... Obviously, we're the tank, so we go in, we block to get into Defiant Stance when we are in a sticky situation. And then we go ahead and we do some attacks, and we get healed for 15% of the damage dealt. So, very strong perk. One that is tempting to get that we don't take. You know, we'd have to get rid of something else. You know, this is a crowd control ability. So, in Defiant Stance, the Shockwave pushes foes outward or in onslaught stance the shockwave pulls forwards foes towards you so i don't think like this is an absolute must but there's certain dungeons certain situations where if you're guarding the tree in genesis or something it would be a benefit to have if you're using your great sword at that point just because a little bit of crowd control action but i think you can get away without this one so i don't take it but it would be a viable one to grab but yeah, that covers the Greatsword build, and we covered everything else, so let's go ahead and jump you right into the run. And we are on our way. So right off the bat, very simple. We just taunt the first guy with our Berserk. We switch over to our Greatsword. We go ahead and we taunt the second guy. We wouldn't absolutely have to taunt, but just to be safe, on the first guy to make sure somebody doesn't steal his aggro before they stack up on me we just go ahead and do the taunt then we start helping dish out some dps so 
at this point you can see these two first guys they are wrecked and right along we move so I'm gonna pull up my hatchet throw it at the far swarmer just to gather them all up nice way to grab his aggro without having to run all the way to him and we just go ahead and we mow everything on down so this next group groups like this is where it's super nice to have your big aoe taunts like your berserk has so we're just gonna go right into the middle of this group pop our berserk and switch on over to our greatsword do some blocking and then we're gonna switch over to our calamity counter we're gonna let loose with our leeching vines that's the new ultimate skill that we are deciding to run with for this dungeon Definitely still viable to go with the detonate, but just having fun playing with some new builds and the leeching vines, it is a very, very viable route to go. So we just go ahead, we start the next instance. We got this one little extra mob that's hanging out, but not a big deal. We'll just drag them back to the team, let them take care of them. Then we call over the next boss. So it is really nice having the throwing hatchets, that way you as the tank, you can grab the initial aggro. It is better if you grab it, that means he's going to straight come for you. You know, if your healer does call him over, that means the healer is going to have the initial aggro and you're going to have to steal it back. Not that it's a big deal, but anyway, so we get his aggro, we get him over here, then we go ahead and drop a taunt on him. and. Initially we start off blocking just to be safe that he doesn't dish out a huge ton of damage to us And then we just start DPSing away with our team as soon as he gets his stamina bar drained So anytime you can do heavy attacks, it's very good on anything that's got a stamina bar You know you take the stamina away and then they can't hurt anybody and everyone can just DPS away at their maximum rate So one thing that some people will do on this spot they will call the mages in and do them the same way that we did that little boss. But we just go right in. I go ahead and I taunt as many of the swarmers as I can. Then I switch over to my greatsword and do some blocking. We do have our grasping vines which works very nice for this part. You get yourself into trouble or you just want to do a little extra damage. You want a little extra healing. You pop off your leeching vines. So at this point, it's just kind of rinse and repeat. Keep grabbing the aggro of the next mobs and go ahead and block. Then help DPS them away. So these swarmers, they are definitely pretty annoying. They will take you out very, very fast. You know, tons of little mobs are super squishy, but they do a pretty substantial amount of damage. But they also do a lot of stamina damage. So at this point, we're basically just trying to get everybody back alive. Then we're going to run away. We do need to get mob kills, but those mages are not the best thing to get your mob kills on. So just as soon as, you know, you get those portals open, just run right on by. And then this part... I just come right in between the two tentacles. I go ahead and I hit them both with my taunt. That way they are both hitting me instead of going for our teammates. So our teammates can get basically free damage on them without getting knocked around. So a lot of times I would just go on the back side of the first tentacle and DPS it there. But just to be safe so you know if our teammates end up stacking on me. They don't get knocked. I just go and grab the aggro of both of them. And then we move right along as soon as that stuff is mowed on down. And this first grab, it still does end up being a pretty decent sized grab. But we just grab the aggro on everything and we go ahead and come on back. That way it's not just a ridiculously huge pull getting started off. At the end of the day, it still does end up being pretty much a full pull. We end up getting out Lemley on us, and then the Rangers are out there taking pot shots at us. But not the end of the world. We just kind of jump in the AoE heals, and everybody just DPSs and AoE heals at the same time. 
So the stuff starting to get a little bit low here, but still kind of a little bit too much for me to just totally abandon the team to go sit on the range. But we do have one DPS that goes and takes out the extra archer. So always a good thing if you're a DPS looking out for your team by going take take out the individual range that's just sitting off in the distance. Whether it's an archer, whether it's a mage that you can't get grouped up because the kind of a range unit. So you can't get them to group with you all the time. Sometimes you just got to sit on the big group and let your DPS go and pick off the individual range players. The individual range mobs, I guess you'd say. So moving right along, typically we just go ahead and drop a taunt on these two dogs and drag them right along and stack on this tentacle here. So I get here, and since I know the dogs are gonna be coming straight for me, I just go ahead and hit my Calamity counter on my sword, or on my great sword, and then we just start attacking away. We get a good old taunt on everything, the dogs, the tentacle, and we just move right along. We do end up getting into a little bit of a situation here. I should have been paying attention, and I should have Switched over my greatsword sooner so my berserk would have started going off on cooldown. And unfortunately right here, I think it was our healer, somebody went right in. I didn't have my taunts ready off of cooldown. So it wasn't the ideal situation so things got really messy. So you can see how when the timing is off it can make for a big mess versus being super clean. So... We never managed to get things super clean on this whole pull. This is my time, my cooldowns were improperly managed and I wasn't able to get them up at the right time. Didn't have the right cooldowns ready to go when the instant started. That's why you always want your tank to start the instant. Because you just don't know if he has the taunt off of cooldown that he needs to have. So, always best let your tank go in first. So... Your tank obviously does have a responsibility to try and look and make sure everyone looks like they're ready for you to go in when you go in. So it's kind of a two-way street. You know, everyone's got to make sure the other person looks like they're ready before you go in. But at the end of the day, it's, the tank is the one that should be going in first. Got to make sure that he has whatever abilities he needs ready. It's kind of a big spread out area here. So if you can go in and have your taunt ready... You're going to gather everything right away instead of, I wasn't able to. I didn't have my big AoE taunt when we started this instance. So the mob started taking off, chasing everybody else, and I could not group them. So you can see here, a couple of mobs did get away from my aggro. But at the end of the day, I just had to stick on the main stack and let one of the DPS go and peel for our healer. So, but at this point... It's wrecked. We got it. A little bit of a struggle starting off, but we covered nicely and took care of it no problem. We got a nice shrine just through the gate here. So we, anyone that got knocked, we can all reset our knockdowns. But this part here is where our throwing hatchet comes in really handy. Let's us grab the aggro on the boss without letting our healer have to call him over and then pulling his aggro back off him. So we just pull out our hatchet, we chuck a hatchet at the big boss, we drag him over to us, give him a good old taunt, and then we let our healer and DPS go ahead and take care of all the additional adds. Well, we just go ahead and tool this guy around on the opposite side. Works out really clean. Some people like to try and call the ads out individually, but sometimes you still aggro the boss that way and it wastes a lot of time trying to drag all the ads up the bridge. So, ends up being kind of a waste of time for one and two. Oftentimes, it just causes a big mess. So, in my opinion, this is the easiest, most convenient, safest, fastest way to do it. And then eventually I just try to work him deep into the corner. And then just sit there and, you know, I got to do aggros on him. I got to keep doing damage on him. But ideally I'm trying to get behind him. I'm trying to get right up against the wall. And then my teammates can try and get as much backstab damage as possible. 
So this boss is just really annoying. So right now I am exactly where I want to be. So I'm going to try and keep taunting him. I'm going to try and keep doing damage just to make sure that I do keep a hold of his aggro. So it's not enough to just sit there and block only. you got to keep doing a little bit of damage. you got to keep dropping your taunts on him. And when we can, we're going to drop our rending throw on him as well. So mostly working on you know damage mitigation but when we get a chance we are going to throw our cross cut in there which will put us into higher damage intake mode but we try to do that at safe times and other than that we're just trying to make sure we hold on to his aggro try to drop another taunt on him but i'm not quite close enough you got to be within four meters for that to hit him so we do miss him with that taunt, but it doesn't really matter too much. We are still keeping his aggro plenty fine. We're not trying to do any kind of crazy damage here. We're just trying to keep his aggro. We're trying to help a little bit with damage when we can. But name of the game here, stay alive, hold the aggro. And obviously, you know, you got a good team. DPS can take him out. Definitely this guy has way too much HP. Just gets kind of boring for the last half of this boss because he has so much HP that, well, it's just kind of silly. At that point, you've proven over and over that you can beat the boss. He just kind of becomes boring. So... You can skip these mobs on the steps if you want, but they are pretty nice, easy, squishy kills to count towards your kill count. So if you don't kill mobs here, you're going to have to kill them later. So I've kind of decided to just go ahead and pick up those mob kills from now on. You get some good, nice, simple, easy, what, five, five to seven mob kills there. So in my opinion, it's worth to pick them up. So these next couple of bosses, same old same, jump right into the middle, pop my berserk, get my taunt off, and then switch over to my greatsword. Go ahead and start blocking, that's going to put us into the defiant stance, and then we do go and hit, hit them with a the cross cut, and that would put us back into the onslaught stance, but then we go ahead and block right away again, which would put us back into the defiant stance. So you can see every time our cross comes back off of cooldown, we are trying to pull it out. And the best we can, we want to stack these guys up, but eventually one of them does tend to slip away from the group. So eventually if that happens, you're just going to have to go and track that one down that slips away. Usually you can keep them grouped up for the first, you know, half of the fight, but... They are rangers, so once you run out of gravity wells and crowd controls, you know, you just can't keep them grouped up any longer. So, moving right along. Grab the key from the chest so we can open the cellar door. And on to the next boss. Now, this guy does hit like a tank. He hits hard as heck. So... We move right in, we hit him with our rending throw first, then we go ahead and taunt him, and we pull out our calamity counter. His slam, you know, yeah, he'll take people out just like that. You got DPS that are kind of like Khan, yeah, his slam hurts like a bugger. So luckily we were blocking for it, but we still got stunned. So anytime we can drop some weaken on this guy, it's going to be helpful, whether it's with our leeching vines, you know, obviously we didn't have that one available, it is available now, but you can see just like that how much damage he does. Takes one guy out, knocks another one, gets me low, but he hits like a tank, so that's one of the places where it will cause problems to light con dps but at the same time if you don't have light con dps it makes the rest of the run a lot more miserable when it takes super long to kill mobs not really all that fun so 
so moving right along just making sure you're grabbing all of the resource nodes and these two guys sometimes I kill them sometimes I don't it's kind of whatever two extra mobs that two extra mobs that you know you can get now instead of getting later muskets are pretty squishy but sometimes they're annoying chasing around so they decide to start jumping around but at the end of the day, it's not a big deal. Either kill them or skip them. If you skip them, kill more mobs later on in the dungeon. Or if you kill them, that's two less you have to get later on. So this part here, I'm gonna go ahead and get the aggro on the first dog. It's kind of important that you have DPS that aren't like always trying to steal the aggro and doing damage before you as a tank get the aggro. So it's tempting for DPS to just start DPSing away random mobs. But it's always so much better you let the tank gather everything up into a nice clump like this. See if the DPS started attacking the dog individually it would have caused problems. We wouldn't have got this nice pull where everything just got grouped up and just AOE'd down in one nice solid group so definitely one thing that can make runs difficult for you as a tank is if you're running around and trying to gather things up and your dps they start picking things off one at a time very very inefficient so so much faster to just take the extra couple of seconds to let the tank do the gathering and then you go ahead and aoe everything down in one big AOE fast AOE heals AOE damage but yeah same thing here we get in the middle we pop a big old taunt on everything get it all grouped up very nicely and of course you got that musket that's gonna want to try and sneak away but we managed to AOE him down with the big group so anytime you can you berserk it's got a big wide AOE so Go ahead, get in the middle of a big group, and just hit them with that taunt. And chances are you're going to get a good taunt off on everything. In the worst case scenario, if you miss one or two mobs, you can go over them, over to them and hit them with a little bit of a melee attack. Or hit them with your next taunt. So this little group of mobs here, used to always skip it when we didn't need the mob count, but... Ever since the patch that we need certain amount of mobs killed and you know we got the gatherables and all that we just go ahead and AOE this group down nice easy group to get very easy gather very squishy mobs so just go ahead and take them out if you don't not the end of the world you're just gonna have to make up for it at the end which typically we have to make up a little bit of room anyways we have to kill a few of the dormant mobs you know at the very end of the dungeon before we get to the last couple of bosses but we'll discuss that when we get there so all of these instances with Isabella you can make sure that everybody is in before you go because it will close off anybody that's stuck gathering outside and you don't give a chance to get in. So we go ahead, we hit with the AoE taunt, and then we just go ahead and start blocking with our greatsword. Instantly we're going to have damage mitigation. Isabella definitely can hit pretty hard. So we go ahead and we get our taunt off, and then we go into damage mitigation mode with our greatsword. Just trying to get taunts off on her whenever she comes off from being taunted and trying to help with a little bit of damage so your taunts definitely will get you aggro but doing extra damage will help you keep that aggro so just discussing with my team how we want to do this so there's a couple different ways you can do this and I have started to like more to just kill everything down low so one thing a lot of people like to do is to take everything and stack it up top, but sometimes it just gets kind of messy, all just to drag it to one musket, when you could just have your DPS take out the musket. Even if you don't have a ranged DPS, you can just have one DPS go up top and take out the musket. But 
if you got one bow user, your bow user can take out the muskets and you, the rest of your team can focus on just taking out the boss. So, not sure if our bow user could hear me or not, so I just go ahead. Well, I, don't, I don't know. I just like doing it down here. That's what I used to always do, then everyone up, went up top, but I've just been doing it down here again. So we just go go ahead, we'd give everything a little bit of a taunt, and then go and stack on the boss when we can, but... You know, number one goal is to take out this boss because once the boss is dead, the boss will stop spawning in these dogs. So, every once in a while, you might have to just hold the aggro of the little mobs and pull them away from your teammates and they can kill the boss. That works too, but ideally, you just AoE everything down. You can see I got the good old taunt on everything there. And we go ahead and hit it all with the taunt again as soon as this taunt's wear off using our great sword taunts using our hatchet taunts and just like that nice and clean no silly annoyingness of dragging everything right up top that does work too but I just find it cleaner to just do it all at the bottom So we're waiting on a couple of our teammates to go and get the gatherables up top. And we go ahead and get started with the next boss fight. Well, not a boss fight, just a regular mob, but one single random mob. Pretty basic. Nothing really to talk about here. Just mow them down. Try and hit that shrine when you come walk through. I know many, many times I've never grabbed that shrine. And typically, I don't know if it's ever costed me by not grabbing it. But if you get knocked here, you're going to go back and hold extra shrine. And you're going to be stuck losing time walking back. So, same thing as always. We just start off with our AoE taunt on Isabella while she's still invincible. Just to make sure we have her initial aggro. And then we go into damage mitigation mode. And we do start trying to put out damage whenever we can. Pop my Berserk Taunt on her again. So at this point, we were just trying to get her finished off. So, <laughs> yeah, our teammate says wrecked. But yeah, we just kind of got, um, I guess we all kind of got greedy just trying to get her finished off. But she managed to one-shot two of our DPS while we are just sitting there all face tanking her so uh, obviously ideally DPS are behind the boss and not in front of it with you but that's just the way life goes sometimes we're not too worried about it so really getting on to the last stages of this dungeon kind of the last long haul before we get to the bosses so there's definitely some bigger pulls in this dungeon, but there's also kind of some long, drawn-out, kind of boring, may I say, parts of it. And this would be one of those big, long, boring parts. So speaking of big, long, boring parts of this run, I am back to this voiceover. Took a break for a couple of days as, yeah, I was getting tired while I was making this, and I had a couple other videos I was working on as well. So, but we are back to it. So this part, pretty basic. The laser can hit you in certain spots, but I point out the spot that I'm gonna drag all these mobs to, and that's where we're gonna taunt them and bring them to. That way we do not get hit by the laser. We can hide from the laser and take out the mobs in peace without having a laser mow us down. So this part, pretty basic somebody just has to jump on the gun and shoot out the eyes of the big ba big mob boss up in the sky so whoever doesn't have the laser on them ideally gets onto the machine and start shooting it if you do get the laser on you you can hide behind the gun and it won't be able to hit you so as a tank there's a few mobs there so just try to grab their aggro 
and let somebody else shoot the gun. So, there's that tentacle over there. You can shoot it. I usually don't bother. I just focus on shooting the big guy in the sky. Shoot his eyes out, and it allows you to move on to the next part. So, once you shoot his eyes out, that little veil, it opens up. So, I just get a head start running to the next gun, and if... I can jump on the gun. Well, you see, the laser's on me. So if I jump on the gun, he's going to laser me down. So I hide behind the gun until he takes the laser off me. And I jump back on and start shooting. So just trying to save a little bit of extra time running ahead. If you're inside this bubble, you are immune to the laser. But when you're outside the bubble, the laser can not hit you. So we could just hold back and wait. Hide in the bubble. But just... For the sake of saving a few seconds, we go ahead and run ahead to see if we can get on the gun and start taking them out. So this part here, you can get a couple of free extra mob kills. You know, we are still trying to work towards our mob count. And you can see me checking, you know, the little scorecard to see where we're at on mob counts. But we do need a few more, so if you take this little bubble, every single mob that you take out with this bubble, it counts towards your mob count. So, just a nice little cheesy way to get a few extra free mob kills. Obviously, we could DPS them down, but it's handy just to take them out with that bubble. So, you, at this point, you definitely want to keep an eye on your mob counts, because you're getting close to the end, and you don't want to... Get to the point where you're going into the bosses and then you realize, oh shoot, we didn't hit our mob count. So we're going to make sure that we need 15 more mobs. So we're just going to make sure that we pick up a few extra here somewhere. I'm going to take out this boss. And that's kind of the main first priority. We are going to pull in a couple of extra mobs along with this boss. I'm guessing the dogs that spawn in don't count as part of the boss kill, I'm assuming. But So we got one extra mob, but I think right ahead here we're probably going to aggro a few mobs. And kind of get ourselves to that mob count that we need. So I don't think the team realized what I was doing here, even though I was talking to them over voice chat about doing it. But... Then they make their way back and we just mow down these mobs. Just an easy place to pick up mob counts. All these mobs are dormant, but if you throw stuff at them, they'll come undormant. And if you taunt them, they'll come after you as well. So, at this point, I think we're pretty good on mob counts. We might kill this mage just for the fun of it, but don't necessarily need it. So there's three, about three more mages that we have to kill, and we typically are going to pick up a couple of extra mob kills in there as well. So as long as you are within like eight or so kills, you're going to be fine. So we definitely don't need this mage kill here, but we just end up killing it just because. So unfortunately I did taunt and it drew the aggro of all of the dormant mobs around us so we end up fighting off a bunch of extra mobs. So we definitely could have just skipped past all of this but unfortunately we didn't and we end up getting in a lot bigger fight than we intended on. Healer gets knocked down. Luckily there's still a nice healing circle up for a long time. And my health gets kind of low there at the end. But we get it done. A little bit chaotic. A little bit messy. A lot more messy than it needed to be. But, but we get it done. Yeah, so. I mentioned, like, if you do taunt. Like, say if I was to pop a taunt right now. I would grab the aggro of all of those little guys that are dormant. And that's the problem I made. I popped a taunt to get the aggro of the mage, but I also picked up the aggro of a bunch of extra little guys. So, right in here, you gotta kill these three, three to four mages, and it must be three, I don't remember. But you're also gonna pick up a few extra mob kills. You don't have to focus on killing the mobs, you just kinda focus on killing these priests, but you are going to pick up a few extra mob kills as well. So 
for one thing you can do here is you can kind of pick up the extra aggro of the mobs and kind of tank them around the outside but g generally speaking just jump on the boss and aoe everything down with your team that way you can get a nice aoe heal on the priest and just everybody can aoe everything down so we we got way messier here than need be so typically what we do is just the whole team would rotate around and the whole team would stack on one priest at a time but we started hitting different priests at different times and got messier than it needed to be but it still got the job done so typically i would just say your whole team goes ahead and stacks on one priest at a time go ahead and stack you know some aoe heals get the sacred and drop it on the priest and your whole team just aoe's that boss down move on to the next priest and get a sacred and whole team just aoe that priest down one after the next no need to get fancy like that but anyways this guy just super super simple a named guy one of the mini bosses you know just typical tank and spank you tank them, you take mostly aggro, let your DPS take them out. And just like that, we are on to the first main boss. So, this one can be a fun one. It's not too bad, but one of the harder parts is his moving circles. So, it does seem like the circles move a little easier than they used to. All you used to have to do is keep one mob alive on you when the fire circles start and then the fire circles won't move on you but it seems like they move around a lot more now it seems like maybe if you don't kill any and you tank just a ton of mobs then it's not gonna move where it used to be you just keep one barely alive and then the fire circles won't move on you so yeah at this point just make sure your whole team is ready before you go into the boss doesn't pay to jump the gun you Maybe you have a DPS or that wants to change a weapon or a healer that wants to change a weapon or a build or they just need to recoat, you know, get their coatings on so they're going to do enough damage so you don't make the boss fight too difficult. Maybe they need to repop some food and yeah, just make sure your whole team's ready and go right on in. So basically just great sword block when we need to stop damage coming in and when we feel safe we just go ahead and we start attacking. I think I ended up right off the start I got a stack of flames on me because it was such a far run I couldn't find <laughs> obviously there was a place right next to me that I could have gotten on. But yeah, one stack, one stack of flame isn't the end of the day, but you start getting multiple stacks up and it can get you in trouble. You start taking a lot of AOE damage or, you, or D, DOT, I guess, damage over time. So one thing right after this Right after this instant, you know, as soon as the boss reappears, he is going to come at you, the tank, and do his little tail wag, tail flip thing. So try to run away from your team, but sometimes when they kind of run the same place you do, there's only so much you can do. So this part I do, when possible, like to pull out my hatchet and throw a rending throw at the orb. Just to give it rend, make it just a touch easier for the DPS to kill. But at the end of the day, it is your DPS's job to kill the orb and your job to keep the boss's aggro and keep yourself alive. But it does happen on, on occasion. Sometimes your DPS end up in a situation where they get knocked or get killed and you do actually have to go and help your team DPS the orb down. But if... You do run into that situation. Sometimes you can't put your teammates in jeopardy of getting knocked because they're trying to take out the orb. Then you run and sh hit the orb as well. But then the boss will follow you because you have his aggro and he'll come and knock a DPS. But sometimes that's your only option. If you have too many DPS that die, get knocked, or else if they 
you know, complete full die, even worse. But I definitely have had that happen where the only choice was for me as the tank to go and help DPS the orb. If you do not get the orb down, it explodes and everybody gets an extra stack of fire damage. So I'm already on one stack of fire. So two stacks is still survivable, but it starts getting to be a pretty big pain. Three stacks is, so oh geez, good luck. But yeah, you can see once again, this boss comes straight for me. Right after, you know, right after these fire circles come, come undone. And you just got to be ready for it. You got to be ready for that dodge. So at this point, I am working on doing a little bit of extra damage to the orb since one of our DPS is down. Just doing it with a chucking hatchet. That way I don't drag the boss onto, you know, onto the orb as well. So if the DPS are sitting there just DPSing the orb, they don't see the boss coming, I go run and, I go run and hit the orb you know, melee style, I could definitely drag the boss's aggro right onto them and take them out. So we don't exactly want that. So I did hit my death defy there, ended up in a little bit of a situation. But managed to stay alive, even healer went down and had to rely on some pots to save me. But that is what they are there for. And that is another reason why I love the hatchet. It's just a nice safety net. And sometimes you end up using it when you wouldn't need to. So you end up procking that death defy when you could have played it safer. But at the end of the day, it's there to use. So make sure you make use of it. So you can see that the fire circle is moving even though all of the mobs aren't killed. But it doesn't work quite as well as it used to. But I have tested it some more and it seems like if you do keep all of them alive, the fire won't move. So these fire rings, they move if you kill all of these mobs but if you don't kill them and you just block you hold grab their aggro and you don't kill them it seems like they still doesn't move but it feels like you have to leave all of them alive so you can see we got some people down so this is a situation where I just have to go for it even though you know I put my teammate in danger of pulling the boss on him and knocking him just felt like hey we kind of are short a couple of guys, so I'm going to get on that and go help DPS it. They probably would have been fine without me, but I already have one stack of fire. I don't want to get any extra stacks of fire. Don't want to die, so in order to do that, I do want to help take out that orb. So you can see there, I do chuck my rending throw. So that's just throwing my rending throw at it is going to be enough to help them out a lot. Because it's going to help them do extra damage. So even though I'm not specifically doing damage. Adding a little extra utility by throwing the rending throw at the orb. And doing my part in helping doing damage. Even though I'm not really. So at this point boss is super low. So we are just trying to finish him off here. I think there's just a few of us alive left here. So yeah, actually it's just down to just two of us left to finish him off. But you could see, you know, even though I don't have my sword and shield, we have our great sword and hatchet and still decent survivability, able to finish off the boss just with two of us, no healer. Healer was healer was dead for a while, no healer to help us sue it, but even without a healer between my great sword and my hatchet Still able to have some really good survivability on, you know, one of the main bosses, main parts of the run. So, there is greater survivability with the Greatsword than some people act. It does have more viability for tanking than some people may make it sound. So, at this point, we are moving right along, right on to the very last boss of the dungeon. So... Same thing here, make sure everybody gets in. Everybody should be coded up and ready to go 
you know, they should have gotten ready at the last boss, so. Yes, we were in the chat, we were talking about how those mobs, if you don't kill them, then the circles won't move. And couldn't get it to work for me this the morning of this run, and it wasn't working for this run either, but sounds like maybe if you don't kill any of the mobs, you just tank all of them, then the fire circles won't move. It used to be as long as you keep one alive, then the fire circles won't move, but it sounds like you just can't be killing any of them. So, on with this boss here. So, we're mostly going to be trying to work on being into the Defiant Stance here. Because we are the tank, so we want to mitigate as much damage from this boss as possible. And the fact that the Greatsword has Defiant Stance, and that means you're going to be able to mitigate an extra 15% damage. So even though you lose a little bit of your blocking ability, you do gain, you know, a little bit of extra survivability just from extra damage mitigation. And of course, you do have your extra blocking skill. And we do still have our hatchet for life save when we need it, just like we ended up in that situation, pulling it out. So we are in our defiant stance. So we are going to mitigate any incoming damage so lots of just blocking getting in a few chunks of damage here and there in between mostly keeping our great sword out for the most part unless we need to do a taunt with our hatchet or unless we get in a really sticky situation that we think we're gonna need some life save but just being in defiant stance on our great sword definitely very good for mitigating damage And we can always pull out our Calamity Counter if things get really sketchy. So you can see right there we are down to just one Stamina. And we end up losing it all. Gonna switch to our Hatchet. Pop a little heal here. So you can see we get a little bit... Get a little bit sketchy here. A couple of DPS go down. And uh, boss is low. But this point we're just trying to finish it off try to survive go for the win you know just down to like five percent health or less but we get our guys back up and ready to just finish her off right here so you could see even though only running great sword and hatchet at the m10 level it's very, very viable. It's going to depend on the group for sure. If you got a weaker group, you just might have to stick to the sword and board. Because it is going to have a lot stronger blocks. But, if you have a strong enough team, it's super viable to run great sword. It's very legit, very good, very fun. So, go ahead, give it a shot. And, let me know how you like it. So we got a scorecard coming up here. I don't remember exactly what we got, but smashed it pretty hard, I know. 74k points, 44 minutes, so we had like 16 minutes to spare. Got all the gatherables, you know, it wasn't a speed run. You can do a speed run and get minus, you can get below 30 minutes on this dungeon, which is, you know, pretty crazy. You're going to have to be pretty good because you're going to lose a lot of points by not getting all of the mob kills, by skipping some of the named enemies. So it can be a little bit tricky to speedrun it and get a super short time, like sub 30 minutes, and still get gold. Because you're flirting with reaching 50k points because you're going to miss some of the multipliers and you're going to lose some points. So you're going to have to get a huge time bonus to make up for it, and you're going to have to avoid getting any kind of team wipes or lots of respawns, which will cost you the run. But that's it. hope you liked it, and we will catch you on the next one.